wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to gather together. Today we're going to sing, we're going to pray. Uh, we're going to send a group of us, uh, five of us, to Southeast Asia. And so we'll have an opportunity to pray over some folks in a little bit. And then, uh, man, I cannot wait for you to meet Pastor Hisham Shahab. He is here today to share his story and, and the impact of God's radical grace and forgiveness, not just in his life, but how that has ripple effects into the lives of others. And, and so why do we do this? It's to tell the story of how God invites us to love him back, to love others, and to live like Jesus. And so uh, we'll be in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, kind of to guide and focus our message time together. So uh, you have Bibles right in front of you. If you're at home, you can log on to BibleGateway.com and find that there. All right. Hey, let's pray as we get going. All right. Uh, good morning, Lord. Um, and that is your name, Lord, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And we place ourselves into your presence today. It's already here wherever we are because we know your Holy Spirit, first and foremost, wants to dwell and live in our hearts. And so we declare that today as we sing these songs, as we come to you in prayer, as we gather our hearts and focus them in on this word that your foolishness to the world is really wisdom for salvation into eternity. And, and God, we just not just want to grasp that gospel truth, but we want to apply that to, to make that not just personal, but to let that have ripple effects where we live, work, and play. And so would you do that today as we gather together? And Lord, just gather, 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 gather. That is the word of the day. Gather our thoughts together as we worship and praise you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. And Katie, why don't you and your team lead us in worship this morning, all right?
believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Death could not hold you. The veil tore before you. You silenced the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring. The praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. And you have your name is powerful uh, it drives out it drives out darkness and your word says that the darkness in your presence it, it cannot stand uh, it has to flee and so we pray over the darkness in our lives today Lord that, that it would be gone in Jesus name whether that manifests itself in in anger or maybe depression or anxiety God, uh, the darkness uh, of maybe guilt and shame, uh, the burdens that we carry, uh, God, our sin, uh, it just weighs us down. And we hear those words that in, in the name of Jesus, we are forgiven, that we are loved. And in that love, you invite us to present our request before you, trusting in that same love. And so, God, we present our request for healing in your name before you today. Lord, those who are sick and those who are recovering from cancers, uh, from other diseases that, that we may not even know, um, God, the things in our body, while they are physical, we know that you are the great physician, so we give them to you, trusting that you do heal our bodies and you do care and love our bodies, even as you care and love for yourself and your body while you were here on earth. And God, uh, for, for the body, the body of Christ, uh, we are the hands and feet of you here. And we pray for our community as we gather, as we hug, as we embrace, as we encourage those around us in our workplaces, our schools, our communities here today. We know that, that there, there is just violence. It just seems like it's getting worse and worse. And we know that is not a surprise to you. And so uh, in the middle of the violence, whether it, it is, it is uh, the violence that we see on the streets or the violence in homes or the violence in our own lives that is not seen, God, uh, we pray for peace today. That your peace that surpasses all understanding would guard and keep not just our hearts and minds, but the hearts and minds of our neighbors as well in your name. 
God, today uh, we do pray for life, and, and there are millions of people uh, who know you, who don't know you, who are, who are praying the same prayer. And we pray that, God, life would be advanced, Lord, uh, in all its shapes and forms, Lord, from, from life that is not yet seen to life that is at its end and everything in between. And, and we pray for life eternal as well. And we know that comes from faith. So we do pray for the faith of people today as well. Uh, God, that you would grow not just our faith, but that you would create new faith in the lives of people through your Holy Spirit. And there are just so many other prayers that we have, and we offer them in the mighty name of Jesus, who taught us to pray these words together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, you can find a seat as we continue with worship today, all right?
Jesus Messiah, Lord of all. Let's give glory to God this morning. Hey, uh, again, good morning to everyone. If you came in a little late, I'm Pastor Tim, and if you're online, good morning to you as well. Uh, our Southeast Asia mission team, all right, you guys are going to come on up right now. Pastor Matt and others uh, from our board directors, elders, uh, you guys are going to come on up. And uh, as they're coming up, hey, just want to give you an opportunity to respond, you know, uh, to that love that we have from Jesus, our, our Messiah. Don't be shy. Come on up. Come on up. Um, hey, um, right now, just want to let you know, you can complete a connection card. Let us know you're here. And uh, this is part of an offering. You're, you're offering yourselves. And if you're looking to offer your time or your talents, you can let us know on this connection card and somebody will follow up. Uh, if you're a first timer here, all right, welcome to you. And on the back, especially for you, but for all of us, uh, there's a prayer request area. And let that be your offering here today. You can place this card in the back of the room in one of those boxes. Or if you're online, you can just drop it in the chat or click on that link. All right. Or if you'd like to give your, your money, all right, finances, you know, this is a, an outpouring of the love. We never say you give to a church or certainly under force or coercion or to guilt you into that, but we give through a church to love God, love people, and to see more people living like Jesus. So if you, you'd love to see that, go ahead and you can give an offering today. There's boxes in the back again, or you can go online like my family does, uh, online app. Uh, go ahead and check that out, all right? Um, hey, coming up, we have a coat drive going on right now, all right? And you can have another week or so to bring those coats in to the lobby anytime during the week or give our office a call. Let, let us know you're coming by and we can have a place for you to make that donation. Uh, if you're sending an Amazon donation, all right, go ahead and do that. Just click, click, click. Uh, it's that easy, all right? And again, all those coats, they're given away. We don't keep any of them. We give them away to to kids in the fall uh, as they go back to school, and no doubt on a day like today, they are being blessed and experiencing that love that has come from your hands in that very practical way. So you can go on to our website, oslc.com slash coat drive to, to learn more, all right? Hey, Pastor Matt. And Brian, <laughs> Brian, why, why don't you guys uh, pray over this team and uh, as we are sent uh, into a very different part of the world. Yes, hey, good morning. My name is Brian Bestman, elder here. And um, we're just excited about this trip. Matt, Gloria, Pete, and Tim are heading off to Southeast Asia early um, on Tuesday morning, right? You know, tomorrow morning, yeah. And I just wanted to, you know, I just picked a Bible verse to read real quick here. Romans 15, verse 13, that says, May the God of hope fill you with all the joy and peace in believing, so that by the power of the Holy Spirit, you may abound in hope. And you'll, uh, my wife Monica and I um, and Jeff and Lucy Cole got to make this trip, at least to Indonesia, here a few years ago. And what an experience. So uh, we're, we're jealous. We're sure looking, hope you're looking forward to it. And like we talked about earlier this week, you know, remember the sights, the sounds, the smells, even, right? I mean, it is so different than what we have. And, and the most important thing is the people. I mean, they are um, just so genuine, so warm, um, caring um, type people that uh, it'll bring lifelong memories. We were there a week, and we still stay in touch with the people there. So that'll uh, we're, it'll be special for you guys, and we can't wait to hear about uh, the trip back and sharing the stories and memories with all of us. So. Um, I wanted to share a verse from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 31, verse 8. Uh, Moses was speaking to Joshua and saying that the Lord will go before you. He will be with you. He will not forsake you. So do not fear. Do not be dismayed. Um, it's going to be an amazing journey. And we just pray that God is with you, that you are blessed, and that you are a blessing. Yes, uh, join me in prayer. If you want to lift up your hands, you can. I'd appreciate it. Father God, we come before you and we give you thanks for all things. And you are over all things. You provide for us daily and you protect us. Uh, we love these folks and we send them out on their trip. We pray that they'll have a great time. They'll meet lots of people. And that God, that they, that, uh, they would see Jesus in you. Protect them, Lord. Lord, we pray that uh, you would be with them and go before them and surround them with your peace 
and your joy. Jesus, we are so excited for them. And we ask this together in your name. Amen. Amen. Hey, uh, if you want to have a way to join us in spirit uh, as, as we're going, uh, these guides are available at the connection counter today. There are ways that you can, you can actually put into practice some of the ways that we're learning to love God, love people, and live like Jesus while we're abroad. So grab that on your way out today, all right? Hey, check out the, the screen as we move into our kids' message, all right? Good morning, everybody. Pastor Matt here, and I want to welcome everyone to this week's Kids Message. I love facts and telling others about truth, especially animal facts. But sometimes a new fact can seem true even if it isn't. For instance, koalas can sleep for 22 hours every day. Did you know there are only two birds that can fly backwards? How about this? The giant Pacific octopus has three hearts, nine brains, and blue blood. Or what about this? Did you know sheep can recognize faces? The great white shark is the largest predator in the sea. And finally, did you know that dogs are certifiably better than cats? After Jesus' baptism in Luke 4, 1 to 13, we find that Jesus had gone out to the desert to be tested, and the devil showed up and tried to twist what God had said in scripture. But Jesus was prepared to face these challenges head on. He knew the scriptures well enough to spot the devil's twists, and he overcame the temptations. You see, this reminds me of our bottom line today. Remembering what's true can help you make wise choices. It's important for kids to remember that if they have a big question about what to do, they can look at the scriptures or talk with somebody who knows the scriptures well, like a parent, a grandparent, a Kids Connect leader, or even a pastor or minister. Let's pray. You can repeat after me. Dear God, help me to know what's true according to the scriptures so that I can make wise choices. In Jesus' name, Amen. For more Bible fun, videos about today's lessons, and conversation starters for your family, head to the section called Kids Connect at Home in today's Kids News email. All right, kids, it's time to head to Kids Connect. So find your leaders in the orange shirts in the back. Have a great week, everybody. Growing up in Lebanon, Pastor Hisham was recruited by extremists, fought in the Civil War, and was on track to become an imam, a Muslim pastor. At age 20, his brother was killed by the Christian militia in that very war. Desiring to destroy Christians, he began studying the Sermon on the Mount. And with Jesus' words, love your enemies, the Holy Spirit began to push the hatred out of Hisham's heart and filled it with Jesus' peace and love. Motivated by that radical grace and life-changing love, he translated the Bible into Arabic as he ministered to Lebanese communities. He started at Salam Arabic Church, the first Arabic Lutheran church in Chicagoland, started by former Muslims and one of the first of its kind in the Western world. And today, Salam Ministries stretches from coast to coast, sharing that same radical grace and unending love helping immigrants, refugees, and international students, as well as equipping people to build deeper relationships among their Muslim neighbors. Let's give a warm OSLC welcome to Pastor Hisham Shahab. Welcome, Hisham. Glad you are here. And as we hear from the Word of God this morning, you can find a Bible. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's what will focus our conversation here today as well. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I'm going to begin in verse 18, all right? This is about the Apostle Paul speaking to Christians, all right, like you and me. 
And he says this in a declarative way. He says, For the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are dying, but to us who are being saved or living, all right, those of us who have life, it is the power of God. It is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment or the knowing of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the foolishness of what we preach to save those who believe. Why? Because Jews demand a sign, and Greeks, they seek wisdom. But we, as Jesus followers, we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Why? Because consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many are powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. And God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that... No human being may boast in the presence of God. And because of him, you who are in Christ, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification that's being made holy, and redemption being bought back, so that, as it is written, let no one who boasts, let the one who boasts, rather, boast in the Lord. Mm. This is God's word. Hey, uh, Pastor Hisham, let's jump right to it. You were born in Beirut. Yes. Uh, that's in the country of Lebanon on the other side of the world. And from a very early age, um, you experienced this tension uh, between the culture that you lived in, which was, was largely Islamic, yes. right? Largely Islamic. And you experienced the attacks of that that culture, specifically in, in the sense of this tension between Muslims and Christians. Uh, what was that like growing up in Lebanon with that tension? Let me explain first that Lebanon, the Middle East, is a different country than other uh, countries because mm-hmm. Lebanon was created by the colonial powers as a haven for Christians in the Middle East. Mm. So it's the only country with a Christian president Mm. Christian commander-in-chief, and uh, the Christians were half of the population, 50% of the population, but they made the mistake of wanting to be like the French, so they had one kid and a dog. (laughs) And in the long run, in five decades, the Muslims outnumbered them, Mm. and they started to ask for political power, which is their right, but the the Christians won't let go, and... uh, the first civil war we had was 1958, uh, lasted eight months. I was minus two years old then, so I wasn't <laughs> part of it, you know. And my dad was, and, uh, but when we got to the 70s, uh, the Palestinian refugees and militias uh, came to Lebanon and disrupted the balance, of the sectarian bl- balance, if I can say, and they boosted the uh, the Islamic uh, presence in Lebanon, Mm -hmm. and they were the army of Islam, if I can call Mm -hmm. them. And so the Muslims were, started to have more clout, and uh, the Christians feared for their, you know, uh, future and presence, so they organized in militias. Mm -hmm. So from an early age, I used to be harassed by Christian kids, and uh, my first encounter with a Christian boy was at seven years old when I was playing marbles in the field. Many of you may, if they are old enough, they remember marbles. There were no iPads to play with, no computers. <laughs> so marbles, you just, I looked up, uh, 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 William was, William's Christian name in, in Lebanon. I mean, mm-hmm. nobody calls William. I, so uh, was standing above me with a stick, and that stick was a nail, and he banged me on the head. 
He got me here. You can see mm -hmm. the scar, yeah, the scar. And blood spattered my face. So that was my first encounter with a Christian boy. And there was a lot of hate, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember that they would swear at me behind my back. You know, I was walking through in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know. So a lot of hate towards mm -hmm. Muslims, you know, mm -hmm. uh, from the Christians. Mm -hmm. So, uh, we, and we felt as Muslims living in shame because we were the only Muslim population in the Middle East subjugated by a Christian mm. commander in chief, you know? Yeah. So. so the political dynamic brought some of that tension, but also as the population shifted, as you said, yes. uh, you really felt uh, the effects of, of sort of m the militant side of Christianity uh, as a cultural Muslim. Well, if, if I can say the militant side of Christians, not yeah. Christianity, yeah. because like, uh, and uh, uh, they were armed to the teeth. They were uh, well supported by some Western, actually, countries, mm -hmm. including France mm -hmm. and Israel as well. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were kind of felt that we are the underdog. Like, uh, you know, Muslims pray on Friday. So if you want to go, that's their, their mm -hmm. congregational prayer. Mm -hmm. So if you want to go on Friday and you are an employee or a teacher or something, you have to sneak out and sneak in mm. while Sunday is the official holiday yeah. for the religious the, day of the, the week. The Christians yeah. enjoy Sunday. Yeah. And uh, so we were, we were trying to uh, impose Friday as a mm -hmm. holiday. We failed, you know. Yeah. Until today. Yeah. <laughs> so so you, grow, you grew up, um, age 13, you were recruited by a group of uh, what we would call extremists, and you were really on track of becoming an Islamic pastor or a yes. Muslim pastor, what we call an imam. Yes. Um, what drew you into that? What, yeah. what was attractive yeah. in becoming a, a religious leader? You know, I, um, I was uh, a bookworm since I was kind of the age of 10 or 11. Mm -hmm and uh, think a lot about what's going on around me. Uh, if you live in Lebanon in the 70s, or I mean, even today, you hear the, the Israeli jets breaking the sonic barrier, mm -hmm. you know, boom, boom, and that the Christian militias are, you know, uh, imposing, they used to put checkpoints mm -hmm. in the streets, and uh, they check your ID. This is something you have never heard of, maybe. If you, they, they write the, the sect on the ID, the religion. Mm -hmm. Muslim, okay, come down. They will mm -hmm. and shoot you, you know. Mm -hmm. So m many were massacred in the 70s like mm -hmm. that. So, uh, so I was looking for answers. Mm -hmm. And the Muslim Brotherhood told me Islam is the answer for everything, you know. We say rightly that Jesus is the answer. But Islam is a political system, an mm -hmm. economical system a religion, a faith, what have you. So they say Islam is the answer, and uh, the Muslim Brotherhood gave me books that explained, like, uh, what they say is that we, we became the underdog in the world, mm -hmm. not only in Lebanon, because we did not follow uh, the commandments of Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. Mm -hmm. We were not good Muslims, so when, when we were good Muslims, we were able to build a global empire from India to Spain, mm. okay? So uh, this attraction that uh, it will give, uh, you know, me answers as well as, you know, uh, more than answers uh, to be effective into transforming the community, mm -hmm. which Muslims were losing their, uh, you know, faith, if I can say. Mm -hmm. They were nominal Muslims. Mm -hmm. So we were trying to Islamicize the community mm -hmm. in order to change the social network, uh, uh, you know, uh, fabric, and then build again a Muslim mm -hmm. state, mm -hmm. an Islamic state. So one important story how I got into, be, uh, into this uh, track to become an imam, a Muslim pastor, mm -hmm. if I can say, mm -hmm. I was going with my brother to uh, test a small mortar cannon. And this is an important story because it, it makes you understand the dynamics of Islam more. So it was a small mortar cannon, and uh, we kind of uh, went to the green line between the Christian and the Muslim neighborhoods, and uh, 
After the third shell, I felt uneasy because I told my brother, he was two years older than me, mm -hmm. that this bomb may fall and kill innocent people. I didn't sign up for that. I want to defend the Muslim community. I want to revive the Muslim community, not to kill innocent and civ uh, civilians, innocent people. So uh, I convinced him to pull out, and I went to the headquarters of the, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood leader was there. I asked him the same question. I signed up to defend the Muslim community mm -hmm. against the Crusaders. We called Christian Crusaders. Mm -hmm. You know, you see in Islam, history is alive. They don't forget the Crusaders. They don't forget mm -hmm. the, the past glory. They, they look for the future and work even slowly to build a caliphate, a Muslim, mm -hmm. you know, community. So I asked them the same question. I signed up to, uh, you know, defend the Muslim... Uh, you know, community against the Crusaders. Now I see myself maybe killing civilians. He asked me a question which a key to understand Islam. Who is your example in life? I said, Muhammad, the prophet of Islam. He said, this is the best answer because Muhammad uh, shelled his uh, uh, enemies with catapults. Mm. And catapults are blind medieval machines while also, uh, mortar cannons are, are blind modern machines. By analogy, we're doing the same thing. We have to weaken the enemy. A dead civilian is better than a, de a dead militiaman. And uh, he said, nobody asked me this question before. You seem to be like a thinker. I said, well, I, re I read your, the founders of the Muslim mm -hmm. Brotherhood, the books, and uh, I, he heard me recite the Quran once and he said you are excellent in reciting the Quran and start memorizing it and he said we need new blood you know mm -hmm. we need new kind of uh, leaders in the future and you are from a good family now the name Shihab may sound like shish kebab here you know <laughs> but uh, Shihab in Beirut we were 5,000 voters when I left mm -hmm. now they are 10,000 maybe mm -hmm. you know so uh, there is Shihab Mosque. I went to Shihab School. Oh, Imagine, yeah, you know, yeah. Shihab Islamic School. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, he said, we, ne we need new leaders. So, but God's hand was there, kind of. I was, they assigned a mentor for me, and uh, in six months they were able to microwave me into a preacher. And uh, <laughs> I was ready to give my first Friday sermon. And uh, Two weeks before that, I was going to visit my aunt in her summer home in the mountains when I got into a car crash, mm. uh, broke both legs. Mm -hmm. Instead of, of preaching Friday, mm -hmm. I kind of, I was mm -hmm. uh, uh, hospitalized for 50 days, broken both legs. Mm. And, uh, you know, uh, and this really kind of uh, uh, blocked my kind of uh, me on the track mm -hmm. of becoming an imam, you know? Yeah. yeah. So all that's happening. Uh, you're starting to become an imam. Uh, you yeah. have broken legs. And, yeah. and just in the middle of all that happening, yeah. you get word that your brother died. Now, this, is, right. this happened later that yeah. uh, I, uh, I was hospitalized at the American University of Beirut and mm -hmm. I remember that my brother used to carry me. He was a, uh, an athlete, and uh, when we used to go to physical therapy, I, I couldn't even walk on crutches, you know, because mm -hmm. both legs were broken. He would carry mm -hmm. me. And uh, I got interested into medicine, you know, mm -hmm. uh, through the American University Hospital, and mm -hmm. uh, so I, I decided to teach myself English in order to go to the medical school. So mm -hmm. I. And I thought the Muslim Brotherhood really encouraged their people and leaders to become, to go to high places in order mm -hmm. to put more influence into the community, to have yeah. more influence. Yeah. So they blessed that. And uh, so I taught myself English by reading Louis L'Amour, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> yeah. And I like cowboys and Indian stories. So. <laughs> So in 1980, I was a freshman at the American University mm -hmm. of Beirut in my first semester when my only brother, my only sibling mm -hmm. was killed by a Christian militia. Yep. I was devastated. I couldn't focus yeah. on my studies. Mm -hmm. I got a silencer and a gun and decided to kill my enemies. Mm -hmm. And any uh, member of that militia, I thought, is game, you know. And I, uh, 
some of them were my classmates, and I thought I would make friends with them in order to mm. ambush, know where they live, how they move at night, in order to ambush them easier, mm -hmm. you know? So, uh, but I came one morning to, uh, from a night of stalking those people when I heard something that would change my life. Mm. It, I signed up for a course of cultural studies World, like it's more than world religions because it included philosophies from also from Socrates to Nietzsche, mm -hmm. uh, myth, uh, Greek mythology, mm -hmm. uh, then uh, quotations from the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Quran, mm -hmm. the Book of Islam. And that morning, the quotation uh, the professor uh, chose was the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. And in the middle of my hate and I heard, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. I thought, wow, this is ridiculous. I had memorized half of the Quran by heart, and the Quran tells about the miracles of Jesus, not about his teachings. And this Jesus Christ in the Bible is different. Mm. So who could love his enemies? The second day, uh, she uh, brought a quotation from Matthew 22 when Jesus was asked uh, by the Pharisees about the greatest commandment. Mm -hmm. Rabbi, what's the greatest command? They were trying to trick him. He said, love God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. I thought, wow. Muslims are, are trying to love God. If you think it's a big deal to come to church Sunday morning, remember that Muslims go to, to the mosque, devout Muslims, at dawn mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the first prayer at mm -hmm. dawn. But this Jesus Christ is overdoing it, you know? Who could love God with, <laughs> like that, you know? So I, so the death of my brother, like, you know, gave me a, an existential shock. So huh. who could say something like this? This is superhuman. So I got a Bible and started comparing between the Bible and mm -hmm. the Quran. Yeah. But I thought I should never leave any stone unturned. Maybe the, the truth is not, mm -hmm. the, the words of Jesus turned the tables of history on me. Mm -hmm. So uh, maybe the truth in, is not in Christianity, maybe it's not in Islam, mm -hmm. maybe it's, it's in Eastern philosophy, you know? Mm -hmm. so, so I looked for a Hindu temple or a Buddhist mm -hmm. temple in Beirut in mm -hmm. 1980, 81. Mm -hmm. I couldn't find any. I found a yoga <laughs> course. <laughs> Yeah. You're doing downward dogs? At <laughs> the American University of Beirut. So I walked into the classroom, and the, the instructor was a British lady, the, a disciple of the great Mahatma Gandhi, and she said, sir, because all the class mm -hmm. were, were girls, you know, so uh, a muscular young man coming in, and uh, she said, did you come in by mistake? I said, no, ma'am, <laughs> I really signed up for this course. He said, why do you want to take yoga? She, you look really fit, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, I told her I, I'm trying to explore how to reach God through Eastern philosophy, you know. She said, wow, you came to the right place, you know. <laughs> uh, I, I told her, okay, so what, what should I do? She said, if you really want to excel in yoga, you have to be vegetarian, okay. <laughs> So I was a young man, 21 years old. I was doing three martial arts, you know, Shotokan, Rojoryu, and uh, Taekwondo, and jogging five miles a day because I want to really to kill my enemies with my bare hands of needs. I was full of hate, mm -hmm. you know? And I had to get energy for all of this mm -hmm. by munching on fruits and vegetables <laughs> half of the day. <laughs> and spending half of the day in the bathroom because of the fibers, you know? <laughs> but, I mean, in two months I was able to master all the essences, they call them, mm -hmm. the positions, standing mm -hmm. on my head, uh, you know, holding my toes behind my back, rocking, they call it the bow stance. And she said, you are the most yoga student, uh, serious yoga student I had ever seen in my life, you know? She's been teaching yoga for half a century, and she said, you can start with transcendental meditation. Mm. I was given a mantra, in Sans a Sanskrit word, and I was told this will dig into your heart. You have to repeat that mantra thousands of times. And then you will climb up to Brahma or, uh, you know, the creator, uh, and uh, 
And step by step, the last step is samadhi, union with the Creator. The more I repeated that mantra, the more stupid I felt, actually. <laughs> the more I repeated that mantra, the more I realized that I'm not climbing up to God. I'm, in, I'm going down in my filth. There's a better word I can't mention mm -hmm. in church, right? So it dawned on me, we may try to climb up to God mm. with our spiritual exercise. We may try to climb up to God with our good deeds, but it's actually an upside down story. Mm -hmm. God himself came down to us and the word became flesh mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. dwelt among us. Mm -hmm. Jesus, take the cross to change the human tragedy of existence into victory. He took the most shameful way of death to turn it into honor and glory. And I felt I want that glory and peace mm. to forgive my enemies like mm. he has forgiven me. Yeah. I led a, an initiative of peace and reconciliation between the the militia that killed my brother and his own militia mm -hmm. in the end. You know. Yeah. 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 And that radical grace and unconditional forgiveness that your experience, is, it's, it's emotional. It's more than just an idea or philosophy. Yeah. Uh, it's a person. And it's the person who you have gotten to know in Jesus. It took me seven years to to intellectually, you know, accept Jesus, if mm -hmm. I can call it accept, but mm -hmm. it took me more to be called to faith, you know. Yeah. And uh, at one point I was, you know, I, uh, I couldn't do medicine. I did, uh, uh, I did really an associate in science and a BA in English uh, language and a teaching diploma and a master's degree in history mm -hmm. of Islam and wrote a PhD dissertation on Islam. But I was a full-time journalist and a, uh, a professor, uh, uh, adjunct professor at the mm -hmm. American University of Beirut. And uh, at one point I felt that I am not able really to proclaim Jesus, you know, mm. because of all the persecution around me. I lost a job. I lost a job in Lebanon, and I, uh, I actually, I came to the United States. This is a good story in 1999, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. for 10 days. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was the National Prayer Breakfast in Washington, D.C. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I was encouraged. I saw... Uh, 3,000 people praying in the name of Jesus in D.C., you mm -hmm. know. It, this is it. The National Prayer Breakfast is led by the president mm -hmm. usually, you know. And uh, I went back to Lebanon and lost a job because I was accused of being a CIA agent, you know. Mm -hmm. Anybody who works for human rights, and I was a human rights activist, is why I was mm -hmm. invited by Carl Maderas too, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. So... Uh, I wa so the next year, so I lost my job, a good job. The next year, I was invited to speak in Switzerland, and uh, that really kind of uh, uh, time was uh, very, very kind of emotional because what happened is that there were 500 people in the in audience, and I was giving a speech about how the Sermon on the Mount changed my life, you know, mm -hmm. from a uh, a man who's seeking to kill his enemies into a peacemaker. Mm -hmm. So I looked into the audience, there were 17 Muslims, and I thought, I lose my job again, you know, mm -hmm. uh, when I go back to Lebanon. So I decided to kind of uh, tweak things and uh, portray Jesus like a Gandhi, a peacemaker. Yeah. And, uh, I was given a standing ovation twice. I thought, wow, this is a glory today, Geneva, maybe then the UN or some, I'll go places, you know, as they say. So I went to my room uh, in the chalet in the mountain and I thought Carl Maderas was my prayer partner. Uh -huh. When I go back to Beirut, I'll kick him out uh -huh. and uh, I know enough of the Bible to juggle it with the Quran and I'll pose as a tolerant Muslim, you know. Yeah. And yeah. everybody would love that and I'll go places. As soon mm -hmm. as I tried to hit the pillow, the room was full of light, mm -hmm. like an explosion of light. And I saw a, uh, a grave the size of a fortress and two slabs of rock parted 
and Jesus came out in his shrouds and told me, keep on praying. Seek me among the living, not among the dead. Mm. I am not a Gandhi. I am your savior. Mm. I mean, he is a person, you know, mm. not an idea, mm -hmm. not an intellectual idea. He is appearing to Muslims in visions and dreams today. And he, he is, the visions and dreams don't say them. They come to church and ask mm -hmm. questions. You know, mm -hmm. uh, I was uh, hosted by uh, a, uh, a professor from Columbia University in South Carolina mm -hmm. some like more than 10 years ago. And uh, I, uh, after I gave two lectures in, in, uh, at the college, I, he, we went back home with him. He was my host. And uh, over dinner, he, he told me he was a missionary in Indonesia, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, and he had a storefront where it's kind of, uh, he ha held Bible studies for the locals. And one day, a total stranger knocked at his door. And, uh, and uh, uh, that total stranger asked uh, him about Matthew 122. He said, how would you know about Matthew 122? So the Indonesian guy told him, well, 40 days ago, my dad passed away, so I uh, saw him in a dream. And uh, I asked him, Dad, what's on the other side? So uh, he said, ask the man who came before me. So he, went, he walked in the dream further. It was his grandpa who died years ago. And he asked him, Grandpa, what's on this side? He said, ask the man behind me. And there was a man emanating with light, and he told him, there is an American in your neighborhood. Go ask him about Matthew 122. So this is why I came to ask you, what's Matthew 122? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The virgin will conceive and give birth, and his name will be Emmanuel. Emmanuel. And the man came mm -hmm. to faith, you know. So this is, I mean, we have baptized through Salam ministry that I founded in, nine, in 2007, like more than 50 people, you know, mm -hmm. and the last one was December 18, last December. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of them have seen Jesus in vision and dream before they came to ask questions. Yeah. Just, uh, you know, uh, two months ago, an Egyptian, 75 years old, who came to, to America 40 mm -hmm. years ago, he said, uh, he, he posted on Nextdoor app <laughs> that, uh, I am Muslim, I'm from Egypt, I've, I have seen Jesus in vision and dreams the last few years. Uh, can somebody help me? And uh, a lady who knows me uh, texted me about it, and I, I downloaded the Nextdoor app and met him, and I asked him, what did you see? He said, a man emanating with light to the cross around his neck, and he is at a door. I told him, oh, this is easy, Revelation 3.20. Here I am, a knock at the door. Whoever opens for me, I'll sup with him. That's Revelation 3.20. He said, now I understand. I need to open my heart to Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. So this is, I mean, just an example of many. Yeah, yeah. And, and you are a walking, living piece of scripture right here with these stories over and over and over, the foolish things of the world like dreams and visions and um, random connections and you laying there in Geneva, Switzerland and having that experience. I mean, you, you, you talk to any sort of everyday American, Westerner, and they're like, that's foolishness. Like, what are you doing? It, it doesn't make sense. And yeah. yet, it's, the, it's that foolishness that's the wisdom of God that, I mean, gets our attention, right? It gets yes. our attention. So like that vision of Jesus in uh, Switzerland, I was trying to protect my job. Mm -hmm. I went back to Lebanon, resigned from my job mm -hmm. to serve the Lord, you yeah. know? So, I mean, the foolishness of God is better than the wisdom of men, That's right? right. And, uh, and God has been using Salam to change and transform the lives yeah. of many, you know? Yeah. And uh, we love them to Christ. That's right. We yeah. love them to Christ. Yeah. And, and it's that same love that you experience. Uh, again, not an idea, not a philosophy, but a, a person. And, that and that, you, that just seems that, foolish that, to the world. That you follow, yeah. yeah. And he, uh, I think God the Father saw how this human tragedy, like, like uh, uh, Hemingway calls it a biological trap. Yeah. We are trapped in this world, and yeah. we get sick, we get old, we die. But Jesus turned the human tragedy into victory, you know. 
yeah. and uh, came down to earth to be one of us, you know, and uh, help us overcome all the, the pain uh, we have in this world. Yeah. Yeah. That's awesome. You brought a friend with you, yeah. Rasheem. Yeah, speaking love and yeah. to Christ. Rahim, and and why don't you come on up, Rasheem. Let's yeah. welcome Rasheem forward. And, you know, you and, and Pastor Hisham here, you, you guys met. And uh, maybe share a little bit about your story and, and your relationship, how you came to know Jesus. Oh, I love it. You know, because it's how, not just how you, many, it's... How many hours you want him to start? Yeah, I know, I know. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah. It's a ripple effect, right? Yeah, maybe yeah, maybe yeah, just yeah. a couple minutes, all right? Yeah, and then we'll minutes, wrap up. Yeah, two minutes. All right. <laughs> okay, okay. I want to greet you all. Thank you for having us. Uh, I am a grandfather for 16 kids. Okay. Uh, Very I, busy, yeah. I arrived at America <laughs> 24, uh, 2014. Yeah. Uh, As a refugee from Iraq. In summary, in brief. Uh, uh, Christianity focuses on love. Other religions focus on good deeds, and uh, there are conditions. While yes. Christianity is unconditional love. Mm. Yes. This, uh, this is the main yes. point. Yes. When, uh, uh, when I arrived to America, I had very difficult circumstances. I left my good job in uh, South Iraq. I was port health officer. I was the big shot there, you know. My, when we arrived, after 41 days, my wife died yeah. of cancer, terminal cancer. And uh, I didn't speak enough English, and I had two teenage daughters, 17 and 19. So I stayed cooped up at home for more than 100 days. Yeah, with, uh, you know, with the two daughters, I didn't know how to handle them. I didn't know anything except I have money, I can buy a ticket and fly back to Iraq, and this will solve the whole problem. I decided to go back, but لكن I didn't know how to go to book any ticket or do anything like that. Nobody took me to an office to buy a ticket. One day, a neighbor knocked at my door because he watched how the, that the home, there's no movement, nobody comes out or in. So he knocked at my door and asked me, what's your problem? You have no car, no, nothing, you, know? you don't go out. What's the problem here? I told him my story. Yeah, can you help me get a ticket and fly back to Iraq? He said, no. I can help you by taking you to a place where they may help you, but I'm not responsible of driving you back. Yeah. <laughs> So he took me, it was Sunday, I don't know where he's going, but uh, he took me with my two teenage daughters. To, okay. It was a very nice place, like this church, maybe big, bigger. Yeah. It was the first time in a church. So he is saying that in Iraq, if somebody is honorable and doesn't lie, doesn't steal, they call him a Christian, if he, even if he's a Muslim, yes. you know. Mm -hmm. I hope it's, it's really true, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we arrived to that uh, church. And and the guy left and uh, went home. And uh, so we were standing and frightened. We didn't know anybody there. A man came directly to us and uh, asked us, uh, this is your first place, uh, first time here? We said yes, because his, uh, he doesn't look different, but his uh, daughter wears the uh, Islamic hijab, you know? So he discovered, knew that the pastor there knew that they are strangers, kind of, you know. Would you like to go for lunch? 
Benati will so get it. Yes, my yes, uh, daughter okay. say yes, 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 let's go. Okay. You know? So, this man, what work? I don't know. Yeah, he didn't know that he was a mission pastor at Wheaton Bible Church. So, after lunch, he drove us home, uh, but he said, Saturday, somebody will come take you. Saturday. So, said yes, gladly. So, Saturday, we woke up very early because we put on good clothes and we were anxiously waiting for, you know, somebody to come at five in the morning. So, yeah. Around 11, this guy came. Yeah. 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 I, I was driving a 12-passenger van, picking up people to church, so, so those who do not really drive or whatever. I didn't know him, but uh, I didn't know where, where we are going, so, uh, so I called him by name in Arabic, so, oh, somebody who speaks Arabic, okay. I was so joyful that uh, I hugged him and kissed him and what have you. Yeah, so, so, so. Yes, Coffee, know. hot chocolate, what have you, yeah. So we arrived to Salam Fellowship, 40 people from eight different countries, you know, speaking Arabic. They welcomed me, they asked me about my uh, circumstances, they consoled me, and since then things became better and better. He got me a driver's license, took his, uh, I took his kids to school, you know, registered them, and college, and... Uh, whatever he needs, uh, yeah. What I need, do. Whatever I need, the church, Salam, help me. Okay. Salam was the main reason how my heart changed, you know. And, uh, I started reading the Bible, and, uh, and uh, it was bilingual Bible, Arabic and English. And I start to watch those who come to church, those who are Christian leaders, and I felt that God is pouring his love through them, you know. After seven years, I decided to follow Jesus. Open my heart to Jesus. Okay, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah. he, he was like I told him, anybody need help, I help. Yeah, he, yeah. he took people to Secretary of State, the DMV, and drilled them how to drive, got their driver's license yeah. with his car. Live with the you know? Jesus? Yeah. He came happy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Amen. Yeah. Thank you. You see, see. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. You know, that's the power of, yeah. of this radical grace and unconditional forgiveness, is it not? Um, how it's not just for one person. It, it keeps on giving and giving and giving, and it's generous, and it's overwhelming. And so, hey, let's stand as we close out. Uh, our band's going to come up and close us out, too. But, you know, what do we do with a story like this? Um, well, we respond. Uh, we respond by celebrating, by, by saying thank you, but also uh, we... We recommit, right? Um, because something in our hearts, it, it stirs in us. And so, so let's just bow our heads and we pray. And uh, we, we pray, God, that, that this story would draw us out, Lord, um, that it would invite us, not just as a, an idea or, wow, that's a nice story, but, God, that we would see you as a person, as a real person in our lives that shows that same love and that same grace, and the same generosity that changes our hearts, that changes our minds, that changes the way we live, that, that then changes other people's hearts and minds and the way they live. And so, Lord, would, would you draw us out and invite us just to say, I recommit today to that. Lord, many of us, we, we, we've known you a long time, and and sometimes we, we just forget that, that we're your children, we're your kids, and, and this is the love that you have for us. This is, the, this is our story as well. So today we just say we recommit in the name of Jesus 
to growing in that same grace and love. Um, and I don't want to be naive enough to believe that, that there's some people here who might be saying that for the first time. Um, we, we've learned about Jesus, we've heard about Jesus, but Lord, uh, we just personally just say it maybe for the first time. Uh, I, I, you're not an idea, you're not, you're not a philosophy, you're a person for me. Uh, and we say that by faith, that's not something we come about on our own, but it's your Holy Spirit that brings out that response. And so, uh, Lord, as we leave this place now, we cling on to that same faith, that same love, that same grace that you have given to us, that you would bless us and keep us through that, that you would make your face shine on us, be gracious to us, look upon us with your favor, and give us your peace. In Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. Hey, let's thank Pastor Hisham and Rasheed for being here again. And they're going to make their way back, say hey to them in the lobby, grab some coffee and some treats. And next week, special surprise for the message. That's all I'm going to say. Have a great week, everybody. Love you guys. God's blessings to you. Why don't you guys make your way back, all right?